Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and we are kind of third of the way through our Torch to Tunis series. I have been out all day on an actual battlefield tour doing my day job, so I'm a bit tired tonight, uh, but hey, it's going to be fun. So today we are going to be looking at the 756th for Tank Batan and the wider battle for Casablanca and beyond. Jeff Danby, my guest, is an independent military historian. He's active with several veterans associations. And in his book, you can find the links to his book, with a couple of them actually, about the battalion are in the description below. And as always, all the information you need is in that description below. So you'll find Jeff's website, social media links, et cetera, et cetera. So without further ado, I'm going to bring my guest in. So good afternoon, Jeff. How are you today? Oh, afternoon, Paul. Thank you very much. I'm doing very well. So, you know, we, we've covered quite... Uh, a lot already in this series and we've got more to come and we've looked at it from the point of view of, of spies and espionage and Casablanca we've done some big kind of looks at the the politics behind it your focus is really quite narrow so so looking mm -hmm. at one battalion's history and obviously the third division as well but mm -hmm. where did your interest start from was it always tanks was it always the battles tactics what tell us how where your interest came from well my grandfather was in the third uh Division. He was in the 756 Tank Battalion. Unfortunately, he was killed in action in southern France. So uh, I just grew up in a house, uh, uh, a Gold Star family house. So um, uh, I always wondered what had happened to him. Uh, the family didn't know the details. Uh, my dad was a history teacher. So I grew up in a house of history all the time, watching the old uh, World at War videos, the BBC series, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, Victory at Sea series, all that. I just grew up with it. That's what I, that it just was, it's in my blood. So I went to school. I went to uh, DePaul University. I got my degree in history. I thought about teaching. Uh, my dad uh, uh, talked me out of it. <laughs> I ended up uh, going into uh, insurance uh, as an underwriter, but I had, I still had a passion for history. And I, um, I did get to a point where I I, uh, I wanted to go and research uh, my grandfather's history, and that's what set me on this course. This happened probably about uh, 23, 24 years ago. Uh, that uh, was the beginning of the first book I wrote, um, uh, kind of covering the, the action where he was involved in southern France. Uh, and because I had done a number of interviews with the veterans of the 756, um, I felt I was obligated uh, to write a history about them. Um, my grandfather was a member of B Company, so naturally uh, I had a lot more information on B Company, so I focused on B Company, uh, thinking I'd be writing a, another book, and it, it ended up becoming a, a four-volume series, so I'm about <laughs> halfway through that, wow. but it, I think it's compelling. Um, it's very interesting to just follow one company history through uh, about four years uh, of, of war uh, from their beginnings where they were training and they're and they're rehearsing uh, into their first combat. So uh, we'll get the beginnings of that here mm. today. So, And what's interesting, and you know, we've covered it on this channel before, is when you get to armored units, there's different ways of looking at it. You can look at it kind of from the doctrine, the, the strategy, the how are they being used as a arm within the military. Then you mm -hmm. have the tech heads who love to know which when mm -hmm. when they change from the A2 to the A3 and oh look how the armor changed there in that particular mm -hmm. and, and that's yeah. that aspect. Then there's the people, the, you know, a, a tank yes. unit at the heart yes. is the men who are riding, the men who are firing the guns, the men who are repairing them. So over the course of our of our series and, and our history on the channel, we've looked at armored warfare from different levels, and and I find them all interesting. But ultimately, I think it's the people that drive. Oh, the, I, the I totally because agree. you yeah. know, if you're in a tank, you're not part of the doctrine. It's not your dis. You know, the, what the the war department has decided to, to to do with your combat arm is not your choice. You're just there, as we'll find out, fighting through the North African desert or the or the whatever terrain you're facing against the enemy who's very good at what they do and. And, and that's the different way of looking at it. So without further ado, we'll bring up your yeah, PowerPoint. So, okay. folks, I'm telling you now that there is a lot of information, lots of slides today. So probably the questions you answer, but ask about the baton will be covered at some point during the presentation. So that doesn't mean we're not welcoming your question, but maybe just hold fire a bit because I'm fairly certain a lot of the things will be acknowledged. So but do fire away with questions if you've got them. But we'll do kind of big ones at the end. But I think, honestly, a lot of the stuff is going to be covered because I've seen the slides and, and they're really great. So over to you, Jeff, and just tell me when you want me to move on slides and um, sit back, folks, and, and learn about this this particular unit, but also the wider uh, battles that, that they, uh, they were involved in. So over to you, Jeff. 
All right, yes. Uh, well, I'm calling this talk uh, the experiences of the 756 tank battalion in North Africa, but but really um, I, I'm going to concentrate on discussion the um, Operation Brushwood. Uh, that was the code name for the third division landings near uh, Casablanca in November of 1942 as part of Operation Torch. Uh, now, again, before I discuss Brushwood, um, I'd like to provide a little bit of, of, of uh, the 756 background. And then after Brushwood, I'll try to give a quick rundown of, of the remainder of the battalion's experiences in North Africa. So we can go to the next slide. Um, I always dedicate my talks to memory of my grandfather. We talked about him a little bit earlier. Um, as you said, uh, this is a human story. Um, the war, uh, it's always interesting to talk about strategy and weapons and such, uh, but uh, there was this terrible human cost and we can never forget that. And my grandfather was part of that. Brilliant. Slide, please. Yep. Okay. Okay, the 756 Tank Battalion was formed as a light battalion uh, on June 1st in 1941. Uh, this was six months before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, it was created as an independent tank uh, battalion or a GHQ, General Headquarters Battalion. And all of this was part of a new armored force branch in the United States. Uh, this was created in 1940 after the fall of France. It was quite a shock to the War Department. Um, a draft had also been instituted in 1940, so this was a time of rapid expansion of the U.S. Army. Next slide. Uh, uh, this a new armored force was divided uh, between armored divisions. Uh, these were patterned after the, the German Panzer divisions and smaller independent tank battalions. Uh, uh, these were meant to be moved uh, wherever needed on the battlefield, but Basically, an independent or a, a separate tank battalion was designed to give an existing infantry division some armor punch. Uh, so the 756 Light was first assigned to the 3rd Infantry Division, and except for uh, the Italian campaign, they would remain with that division for much of the war. Next slide. All right, so for the first three months of their existence, this was all throughout the summer of 1941, uh, the battalion had no tanks whatsoever. Uh, they had nothing. Uh, so the men had to practice uh, crew communications and platoon and company tactics by marching around on fields carrying these wooden H-frames they constructed in the wood shop. I don't know if that's something people were familiar with, but uh, the U.S. was pretty far behind at that time. I mean, this is interesting, Jeff, and I'll just interrupt quickly, is that we've talked yeah. about this on the channel with like air power, is at this point... The ideas within the USA are ahead of the ability to actually fill out the ideas with with equipment and vehicles. And you know, so they've, they've had the imagination. They've seen what's been happening in Europe with the Germans. Yeah. They've seen the around. But the, the, yet the technology and the production has got to catch up with the people who are having the ideas. So this is this is the same thing with the, 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 the air power doctrine that's being established. There's people have got ideas about the combined bomber offensive and this, that and other. But yet they haven't they haven't got the bombers yet to do it. So it's interesting that, you know, you're putting the. The, the, the cart before the horse in some ways, but you've, you've got to have the ideas. So it's fascinating that these units are being conceived before they've actually got the kit. That's right. And, and part of the problem was, well, part of the problem from the perspective of these guys was uh, they weren't getting tanks because uh, they were being shipped out to the British in North Africa. Yeah. Anything new coming off the assembly lines, anything, any of those new ideas that were be, being uh, put into practice were being shipped overseas almost immediately to help out the Brits. All right, so next slide. Um, in the um, in late summer 41, uh, their very first tanks arrived. Now, these really weren't tanks in the modern sense. These were outdated, what they called combat cars. Uh, they were M1A1 and M1A2 light tanks. Um, they were lightly armored, they were quick, uh, but they only were armed with uh, 30 caliber or 50 caliber machine guns. Um, now, all these we really were good for. We're, we're helping to train the drivers and uh, help train the crews. Uh, but with only eight assigned to begin with, everybody had to take turns. Uh, and, you know, so by the autumn, uh, there were a few more that arrived, and that brought the number up to about 20. Uh, but this wasn't even half uh, that was needed to fill out the table of organization. But at least at this point, uh, the tankers could now train with the uh, 3rd Infantry Division 
uh, out in the field. Uh, they could they could do some combined operations. And, and do you think? And I, I mean, I, and I will let you talk again. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that they are training alongside the infantry they'll be working with for the rest of the war so early is quite yeah. rare because one of the overwhelming yes. problems the British Americans Canadians are having is a lack of decent cooperation between the tankers and infantry. Yes. Yes. And the British it can be based on class and regimental uh, structures and, and culture, but. Even yeah. if you haven't got the right gear, getting to know the people you're going to be working alongside and how they work, would you say that was kind of critical to eventually th th them being successful in combat? I think it was critical for both. Um, uh, there was a point later in North Africa where they became separated, but that enabled them, uh, both both units to go on and to help train uh, other units they work with about how to, how to, how to work together. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, uh, there are actually two was, again, we don't want to get it off, off into the weeds here, but there- Rabbit there hole, two. you're allowed to say rabbit hole. Everyone's going to be very happy uh, that you're avoiding kind of a avoiding that. rabbit hole because they can have a drink. So that's good. <laughs> they're, they're, everyone's relaxed now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, there was really no armor doctrine to speak of at the time, yeah. okay? Uh, so they had to wing this. They were just basically borrowing from uh, cavalry principles. And uh, so a lot of this was sort of seat of the pants. So even the, the training exercises were seat of the pants. So, so that did give them some creativity, okay, mm -hmm. for, bo for both. Uh, they would go on later in the war and be able to impart that on other units they work with. Okay, so um, oh, um, did we skip ahead? Oh, well, oh I just moved ahead. To the, the, yeah, that's the okay. Uh, so they say the, uh, so what happens is that they trained in the autumn uh, they had about 20 more that came. They allowed them to train. Uh, then Pearl Harbor happened. Okay. And uh, with Pearl Harbor uh, in December 7th, 41, everybody should know that date. Uh, the battalion suddenly received their full complement of M3 light tanks about a month afterward. Uh, so suddenly um, priorities shifted in the war department. And uh, now the M3 was a, a better tank. It, now it had a 37 millimeter gun. Uh, it weighed about 13 tons. It was still fast. Um, I, I got Steve Zalaga's book here. Uh, I know you've interviewed him, but, yes, but he's, he's great. He's excellent. Um, I think he, he rates it at 35 miles an hour, but I, I, these guys told me they could get that thing up to 70 miles an hour, I think, in ideal circumstances. Uh, so they were quick. Uh, they, the guys really enjoyed them. Um, and they were considered the U.S. Army's main light battle tank at the time. And uh, now with this, uh, training with the 3rd Division can now kick into high gear. And it, they do this up and down the, the U.S. West Coast. Okay, so, um, yeah, they hold uh, numerous uh, joint amphibious exercises with the U.S. Navy. Uh, at first at Puget Sound in Washington State, and then down in San Diego, and then Monterey Bay, California, during the spring and summer of 1942. Uh, this photo here, I, I, I'm not sure if this is Army or Marines, uh, but at least it gives you an idea of how rudimentary the ship to uh, shore transfer was. Um, uh, these tanks had to be winched uh, just one, one per boat, one, you know, about the size of a Higgins boat, these, these launches, and, uh, and they had to be taken ashore this way. There were no LSTs or or LCTs at this point. So that's important for the uh, viewer to understand that. Uh, here's a, a, an image of one coming ashore. This is an M3 coming ashore. Uh, now the exercises involved in the 756 and the 3rd Infantry Division were the first amphibious training exercises ever held by the US Army on the West Coast. Um, there were some that were secretly done on the East Coast uh, a few months earlier but up until this time, only the U.S. Marines had done such things like this. Uh, um, it's also important uh, for the viewer to just know just how novel and unpracticed this technique was for the U.S. Yeah. Army. Uh, this was all new for the guys that were uh, involved with it. Okay, here's uh, a nice photo, a beautiful photo of the 756. They're lined up here at Monterey Bay in San Francisco. Uh, this, I think, is the headquarters company. Um, you can imagine it's probably four times the size of this photo. Um, the training exercises at Monterey were very extensive. Uh, this was done in rough surf. Uh, it was very similar to the surf that they'll encounter later in North Africa. In fact, these exercises were watched very closely by the War Department. 
Uh, and when they concluded, they were considered uh, highly successful. And uh, I think that the reason, um, reason for Operation Torch was because of these exercises being so successful. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so next, uh, the 756 and the 3rd Infantry Division uh, moved by rail to the East Coast. And this came as a, a big surprise to everybody involved because they just assumed they were headed to the South Pacific to fight the Japanese. Uh, they ended up uh, at Camp Pickett, Virginia, and the 756 was then issued these brand new, uh, right off the factory line, uh, M5 light tanks. Um, these were upgraded versions of the M3s. Uh, they're still fast. Uh, they still had the 37 millimeter gun, uh, but they were given thicker side armor and uh, they had a better transmission. Uh, but most importantly, uh, they did away with that well, uh, riveted hull. Yeah, uh, these are welded hulls. Um, uh, probably everybody knows that uh, a riveted tank, when it was hit, even if it wasn't penetrated, those rivets would pop and they'd become yep. shrapnel inside, and they could tear up a crew pretty pretty good. So, the welded hull was very much an improvement. Um, with these M5s, the amphibious training uh, continued around Chesapeake Bay uh, uh, in uh, September and uh, early October 1942 with the Third Division. And then, uh, next slide, uh, third division, the 756, they loaded up at Hampton Roads, Virginia in late October 42 uh, for a destination unknown. Um, the officer standing there on the left, that's First Lieutenant Edwin B. Olson. He's a platoon leader in C Company, and we'll be hearing a bit about his experiences later. Uh, did, you, did you have any questions uh, so far about the Battalion. No, I think I think that the, the general opinion in the sidebar is that people are, are quite surprised, pleasantly surprised how much amphibious training was done by this particular unit in advance. Because I think, you know, the, the average we talked about Kasserine Pass and the German offensives yesterday. I think a lot of people have the understanding that a lot of the American armored units that were in North Africa were just, you know, green, uh, uh, no experience, brand new tanks, everything. And and, and okay, they're, they're up. They're updating their vehicles progressively, but the fact they have actually understood the basic mechanics of amphibious landings is, you know, because the principles stay the same. Whether you, we, we, regardless of what vehicle and what landing craft you're using, the, uh, the 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 process is more or less the same. So I think people are surprised just how much training this unit had gone through. Oh, I, I think that the third division, the 756, were the uh, the most trained of of any American unit at that time. Uh, the ironic thing is uh, B Company actually was uh, more trained than A and C companies. Um, they had a head start on it. And what's funny is uh, in the next slide, we're going to find out that B Company was left off the table of uh, or was left off the order of paddle because there was a, a lack of hold space in the ships. Um, uh, the, the 7th Infantry Regiment and the uh, 30th Infantry Regiment would be the attacking uh regiments and 15th infantry regiment would be uh, a reserve regiment. That's the reason why B company was left off. They were attached to the 15th. But anyway, A and C companies loaded up headquarters and B companies had to remain stateside for a later convoy. And again, uh, the men got aboard these ships that they had no idea where they're headed. Um, so they thought maybe it would be England. Uh, some thought maybe they were going directly to France. Uh, some even thought it might, might be Norway. Um, I think I don't think North Africa was really on on a, a lot of people's radar at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, here are some uh, these M5 lights uh, from C Company. They're lined up on the quay, uh, waiting loading. Now, if you notice, uh, they've all been waterproofed. Uh, this is to allow the tanks to wade into shore in about three or four feet of surf. Uh, that way, the engines won't drown out or they'll short the batteries. Uh, this was also a new technique. Um, yeah, no, and great, great photos. I mean, it's simply stunning. I've never seen half of these. I've never seen before. I mean, when you sent me the slides a few days ago, I was gobsmacked that so many of these photos. I've just they're just brilliant. You know, um, th these are Signal Corps photos. Some of them are hard to find. I just got a batch more. Um, a, a friend of mine, he's a, a filmmaker named Ron Lowther. Uh, he just got a batch for me uh, that I wasn't able to incorporate in here. Uh, the, the, unfortunately. Uh, but maybe I can put them up somewhere on the website or we'll something. Do, we'll do a part two at some point. Sure, yeah. that'd be nice. Now, once aboard ship, uh, uh, the men were finally told they were headed North Africa as part of Operation Torch. Uh, more specifically, 
Uh, they were headed to Casablanca and French Morocco. Uh, now, if you look at the map, um, Third Division's contribution to the operation can be found on the far left in the Western Task Force. Uh, they would be that middle prong attack, a sub operation Brushwood. Um, did, um, Paul, do we need to go over Operation Torch in detail, or should we skip through? No, we'll do, let, let's. We're, we're going to be covering that in various. We've done it in other yeah. things. Let's let's, let's skip to, to what you're what we're talking about. We'll skip through that because it's it's not worth the time. What I'll do is though uh, we'll skip up to um, the next slide. Beyond that, we'll we'll concentrate on the Western Task Force area. I'll, I'll, I'll go into a little more detail. I'll talk about the three sub task force and just give a brief outline before we go to Brushwood. Okay, that be fine. Yep, please. Yep. Okay. All right. So at the very top, uh, there was a sub task force operation goalpost. Uh, the overall objective was uh, Media. That would be Port Leote, 80 miles north of Casablanca. Uh, there was this was a force of about 9,000 men. It was under the command of Major General Luskin, Lucian Truscott. Uh, uh, units involved were the 60th Infantry Regiment of the 9th Infantry Division, uh, 1st Battalion of the 60th, uh, I'm sorry, 66th Armored Regiment, that was the 2nd Armored Division, and elements of the 70th Tank Battalion. Um, you went back two slides. I went me. back just so we could see yeah. the, the goalpost one, and so then, then I'll go for it. Yeah, that's fine. I'm just, yeah. I'm just trying to... That's fine. That's fine. You can do that. Operation Blackstone is the, at the very bottom. Uh, the overall objective there was the Port of Safi. That's about... 140 miles south of Casablanca. Uh, Major General Ernst, uh, Ernest uh, N. Harmon, he was a commanding general of the 2nd Armored D Division at the time. Uh, he was uh, in command of a force of about uh, 6,500 men. Uh, units involved, again, uh, were uh, uh, 47th Infantry Regiment, uh, 9th Infantry Division, uh, and two battalions of the 7th, uh, 67th Armored Regiment. Um, and uh, more light tanks of the 70th Tank Battalion. So it was a very armor-heavy uh, uh, forces, both of them. And then Operation Brushwood there in the middle. Um, this was also went by Task Force 34 by a uh, Navy. Uh, uh, the overall objective was Casablanca by way of Fadala, uh, 16 miles north to the northeast. Um, the, the largest troops were concentrated here. We're talking about 19,000 troops. Uh, Major General Jonathan W. Anderson, he was a commanding general of the 3rd Infantry Division, uh, was in charge of the force. Uh, his entire division, um, that all three of his regiments and uh, ANC Company of the 756th Tank Battalion were involved. And also uh, attached was the 1st Battalion of the 67th Armored Regiment. Uh, that was also part of 2nd Armored Division, but just for Operation Brushwood. Right. Okay. Okay, French Morocco, yes. Um, French Morocco at, the, or, uh, Morocco at this time was a divided colony. Uh, it was divided between France and Spain. Uh, uh, Spanish held a, a substantial territory north, right there across from the Straits of Gibraltar, as well as some territory to the south. Uh, everybody knows Spain was a, a fascist government at the time, but, but it was neutral during the war. Uh, there were concerns uh, that uh, by the U.S. and British that the Germans might put diplomatic pressure on the on, on the Spanish and flip them over to the Axis side. So uh, the Allies felt there was a need to uh, target this area for an invasion. Mm. And just to remind people, folks, that when Michael Nyberg comes on, and we've got it scheduled for next week, but we still may adjust the time, is Michael Nyberg is going to take us through all the, the complicated politics of what the Allies expected or hoped the French would do, then there's Spain involved, then there's what Italy's response is going to be, and it's a... It's a it's a political nightmare. And it's to, in my opinion, it's the only Allied landing where politics is as important as the actual strategic effect itself. I mean, when you get to Overlord, it's all about the uh, the gaining of a foothold. But with 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 Torch, there's all these diplomatic games, and if we do this, will they do that, and will we piss off them? And we'll, and so Mike Mike is going to take us through that stuff later in the week because it's it's a it's a it's a it's it's complicated, isn't it, Jeff? It really is. Oh, it is. It, it's excellent. I'm glad somebody's doing it. Yeah, and, he, and he's he's far more better equipped than I am to do that. So yeah, it's, it, let's just suffice it to say it's complicated. Yes. Okay, onto the next slide. Yep. Okay, this is the this is the area we'll be talking about here. This is a close up of Operation Brushwood objectives. This is on a 1940s map. Um, the large port of Casablanca was the ultimate objective, uh, but there is a large uh, French naval presence there. So 
any direct attack on there would be extremely unwise, if, if not suicidal. Uh, therefore, the smaller port of uh, Fadala, 16 miles to the northeast, would be the uh, third division's first objective. Yeah. Now, here's a, a rather grainy photo, uh, aerial photo of Casablanca taken from the sea. Um, it's a large city uh, with about uh, 200,000 civilians living in the area at the time. Um, Allied intelligence suggests there's about three or four battalions of French infantry there, uh, plus four mechanized cavalry troops, uh, four battalions of field artillery uh, stationed in and around the city, uh, in total about uh, 4,300 troops. Um, next slide, please. But it's the port itself that's especially dangerous. Um, it's protected by coastal gun batteries. Uh, the, as I said, there's a substantial a French naval presence there, a fleet. Uh, there's at least one cruiser, several, several, seven destroyers, two submarines, French battleship, uh, the Jean Bart. Uh, yeah. That's also docked in the harbor. It's undergoing repairs at the time, so it's not seaworthy, but it has 15-inch guns, and uh, they represent a major threat to the uh, approaching Allied transports. Now, well, as folks, you... Vincent O'Hara tomorrow night is going to take us all through the naval action. So it complements this show precise, perfectly. Meredith Hindley took us through the subterfuge and spies and intelligence in Casablanca. Jeff is talking about the attack from the ground. And now uh, and then tomorrow, Vincent O'Hara doing a naval battle. So it's it's all worked out. But before we move on, Jeff, we had a question and I'm going to expand on it. But the Great Dominion is asking, were the beaches they landed on suitable for the deep wading approach? So he's referring to those photos you showed of the weight of the wading tanks there. But so I'm going to expand that to say how much information had the battalion been given about tides, beach, stone, sand, uh, steepness of the beach? Because when we get to Overlord and even Salerno and Anzio, that was one of the, the real strengths of the Allies is they knew everything, the soil samples, sand samples. How blind do the 756 go in, in terms of the knowledge, the deep, deep knowledge of, of terrain where they're going to be landing? Well, um, unfortunately, the, the record doesn't give me a specific answer to that. OK, I don't have any documentation that that tells me specifically what the what the officers were told. But I can surmise based on the training they had at Monterey and this beach here that the uh, the intelligence um, suggested that the areas were quite similar. And in fact, they were, but there en ends up there was a lot more coral in this area, I think, than they expected. And that ended up becoming a problem for them. Um, it, it'll turn out later, we'll find out all, all the tanks do get ashore. Um, but uh, but in some cases, they didn't even use the waterproofing equipment. They were right. dropped right off on the sand. So uh, whatever whatever information they were given, it, it was it was pretty accurate. Yeah. Uh, I think the problem was the surf was a little heavier than they expected, and there was more coral, uh, rough coral in that area. I mean, it's interesting because that's one of the things that came up with Mark Calhoun yesterday is that that there was, despite the loss of life that happened later on in the Tunisian campaign, lots of things went well with Torch almost by just luck and a bit of kind of good fortune. And, and so by the time they get to some operations later on, they try to cross the T's and dot the I's a bit more and make sure they are fully armed with all the information. But Torch, there's a little bit of a sense of it kind of flying by the seat of their pants a bit and kind of learning how to do amphibious layout operations as they go along. And it, we, we know we're blessed 80 years on that it did work pretty well. But actually, there was a lot of just kind of, well, let's see when we get there about it, which is interesting as that that's where the Allies were in 42. They hadn't yet perfected the art of this two years later mm -hmm. down the line. They're much better, but this time there's a lot more kind of, well, we'll, we'll work it out when we get there. Well, um, it, we'll, we'll go through this and we'll see there was quite yeah. a few mess ups, but fortunately yeah. it all worked out. Right. Brilliant. Um, now so, we did, I, I did want to mention you, I know he's going to get into this, but, intelligence getting into the intelligence the big concern was um was was how the french would react okay yeah, of course uh there was the, the naval or i'm sorry u.s war department intelligence thought that the french army might be more allied friendly or or uh pro vichy but they were more concerned about the the navy being more pro vichy or pro axis so there were concerns about the overall french response but there was a belief that maybe the army might be a little more amenable Okay. Yeah. All right. So the next, oh, what was it? Okay. We're up to there now. 
All right. So, yeah. Okay. So we'll get a little overview here of the U.S. Third Division. Again, under the command of Major General Jonathan W. Anderson at the time, it was reinforced uh, to an overall strength of 19,000 men. This was up from the 14,000 or so that uh, generally comprised the uh, the division. Now, in that middle column, uh, those are the uh, units that were organic to the division. Uh, I did, uh, in boldface, put the key ones. Those would be the three infantry regiments, the 7th, the 15th, and the 30th. Uh, the right column lists the attached units. The 756 tank battalion was still considered attached, although they had been training with the 3rd Division for nearly a year and a half. Uh, that other key attachment uh, was this uh, 1st Battalion, the 67th Armored Regiment. Uh, again, these were light tanks, uh, but uh, they would land in reserve uh, for the eventual push on Casablanca, and they were only part of this division for, for this operation. Okay, plans for Operation Brushwood were drafted and finalized the prior month, October 1942, at Camp Pickett, Virginia. Uh, here's an onion skin of those plans. Uh, in the Fadala landings, uh, the 3rd Division's objective was to silence all the coastal gun batteries, seize the town and the port of Fadala, then fan out, seize all the roads and railroads serving the town. Uh, then they were to move southwest and envelop Casablanca. Uh, the expected opposition, um, there were five uh, naval, coastal, and uh, anti-aircraft installations. Uh, uh, they had guns ranging from 75 millimeters up to 138.6 millimeters. Um, the Fadala garrison there, uh, they expected a roughly 2,500 French colonial troops. And, and there was a civilian population of about 15,000 people living in and around town. Okay, here's a, a close-up of that onion skin uh, showing the configuration and order of the planned uh, landing waves. Uh, we'll go to the next slide here because onion skins were meant to be laid over real maps. Uh, so to help us understand that, I kind of combined them with the Photoshop. Now, basically, if you can look, look at that, you, you see you have the 7th Infantry Regiment landing on that would be the right. That's from the perspective of the attackers. That's yep. on the left side of the map. Uh, closer to Fadala with the 30th uh, Regiment landing on the far left uh, near what's called Fort Blondin. Um, each landing battalion was organized as a, a little task force. Uh, that would be uh, infantry with added engineers and artillery and tanks. And uh, each task force was... Uh, organized to fight independently for several days if necessary. Um, there were also landings on either flank by recon troops and infantry. Um, and again, uh, the, fifth, the 15th Infantry Regiment and the 1st Battalion, the uh, 67th Armored Regiment, uh, were uh, held in reserve uh, for later. And there's a close-up. And here's a nice close-up of the beach area. This would be the, the perfect world how it should have all worked, right? Uh, the 1st uh, Battalion, the 7th, would land close to Fadala on uh, Red Beach 2. Uh, their objective was to take the town and silence the two gun positions on the peninsula. <clears throat> the 2nd Battalion, 7th, was to land at Red Beach 3 and then move inland south to the highway and railroad line and cut that. Uh, the 1st Battalion, 30th, would land at Red Beach 2. And the 2nd Battalion, 30th, would uh, la land at, I'm sorry, Red Beach I'm sorry, what did I say, Red Beach 2? No, Blue Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the 2nd Battalion, 30th, would land at Blue Beach 2. Uh, this was nearest to uh, Fort Blondin. Uh, their objective was to silence the guns at the fort, then move inland to the highway and a railroad line to protect that eastern flank of the beachhead. Now, you can notice, too, that L Company of the 3rd Battalion, of the 30th, uh, they're to land about two miles further east, uh, they're to protect the far left flank, and then they're to, to move west and put pressure uh, on the rear side of that fort. Mm. That's, uh, that's the plan anyway. Okay, so the Western Force uh, set sail uh, from the United States on the 24th of October, 42. It took them about two weeks. It took them two weeks on, to the day, actually. Uh, and they arrived uh, off the coast of Morocco on the 7th of November, 42. Okay, yeah, so um, I get you, I, as they approached, this is where things started to go a little awry. Um, 
As they approached, uh, they were to make two 45 degree turns during the night. Uh, some of these vessels misinterpreted the signals and they fell out of formation. Uh, perhaps, um, it was it Vincent O'Hara you said would be talking? Yeah. Yeah, he might get into some of this, but I'll cover it too. So if it's repetitious, I apologize. Uh, they ran into a, a, some kind of ocean current they didn't expect. And this drifted some of these transports as far as seven miles out of formation. Uh, one of the transports was carrying a reserve unit and it en ended up getting mixed in with the three transports carrying the assault wave. Uh, other transports uh, carrying the reserve units uh, got so far out of position that their, their landing craft couldn't be used to help load the assault waves. Uh, so they ran into some trouble right away. They had to realign in the darkness. This caused some delays. Finally, the ships were able to assemble a six miles offshore. Um, now, this force consisted of about 12 transports, well, 12 transports and three cargo ships. Uh, they also had the protection of two U.S. Navy cruisers, the Augusta and the Brooklyn, and four destroyers, the Wilkes, the Swanson, the Ludlow, and the Murphy. Uh, they also had aerial cover from uh, U.S. Um, carrier Ranger and the escort carrier Suwani. Uh, and at uh, one o'clock in the morning on November 8th, uh, this was three hours before their 4 a.m. H hour, President Roosevelt broadcast a radio appeal across North Africa, uh, telling the French uh, to expect an American arrival and to stack their arms and point their searchlights skyward as a sign of cooperation. This is that politics you were talking about. Mm. Usually you don't want to tip off the enemy that you're coming, right? So that's a, a lot of politics involved. Now, these landing craft, as they were being loaded, um, they looked to the coast, but the lights remained out at Fadala, uh, remained under blackout conditions. So uh, the, the French weren't uh, buying the, the uh, first appeal anyway. Uh, these next photos, uh, next photos here show um, 30th, 30th uh, Infantry Regiment troops. So they're loading here in daylight. Now, of course, it's night when these first waves are loading up. Um, Again, there's no LSTs or LCTs or LCIs. It's only these troop transports and these lighter, uh, lighter craft or Higgins boats uh, used to transport troops and vehicles and equipment. Uh, there's only one light tank or uh, one or two Jeeps can be put on these things at a time. And these same craft uh, have to be used to shuttle back and forth um, throughout the day, bringing in more troops and supplies. Uh, hope is that by the second day, the Fadala port will be secured and these transports to then, then can swing in and start uh, unloading on the pier one at a time. Now, in loading up, uh, these troops had, were called topside in unit order. Uh, each, the men had to climb down over the rails, uh, down this rope or this uh, chain link netting uh, onto these Higgin boats. Uh, this was very hazardous. Um, the wave action, you know, the bobbing of the boats and so forth, a lot of opportunity for error. A, a lot of times these guys, are, there were cases of these guys freezing from fear of heights, you know, uh, and their buddies would have to either pull them down or pull them up. And uh, there is at least one account of at least one 7th Infantry, infantry Regiment man losing his grip. Mm. And uh, the poor fella ended up falling and bouncing off the side of the boat and into the water and never to be seen again. So uh, doing this in pitch dark was extremely dangerous. The next slide here. Um, yeah, again, uh, I, I've got to remind you, there's, there's nothing, nothing to see. There's no stars. There's no ship lights. There's no lights on the shore. Um, and because of this, uh, only about half the tack boats were ready, uh, able to reach their assembly uh, areas in time. Uh, so it's now it's 415. It's 15 minutes before they're supposed to head for shore and the destroyers that are patrolling the departure line uh, report only one wave is ready to go and they needed four to, to, to actually head in. Thus, uh, HR was pushed back by a half hour to 445. Now here we've got a couple of the platoon leaders. We're finally talking about 756. Okay. Uh, we've got Lieutenant Ed Olson. We met him earlier and we've got Lieutenant John Rutledge. Um, these guys loaded on separate landing craft, if, as you would expect. Um, they're leading their five tank platoons, uh, one tank on a boat, uh, 
Uh, each, however, had uh, very similar experiences with this disorganization taking place in the pitch darkness. Um, Rutledge led a second platoon and a company. Uh, his tank and his crew were just sitting on this boat for a, just dead in the water, waiting for something to happen. Um, a wave commander happened to be on that boat, and he, he didn't seem to know what was going on. Uh, after a while, the coxswain um, asked Rutledge if uh, any of his tankers could read a compass. Uh, uh, and they could, uh, but Rutledge answered uh, no uh, because he, he didn't want to lose a crew member to the Navy. Um, the coxswain that was piloting uh, Lieutenant Bols uh, Olson's boat uh, was complaining to Olson that the tank uh, was screwing up uh, his compass readings. Uh, and uh, when the appointed departure time came, uh, he just took a wild guess on the proper direction. And so they're out plodding around in the ocean for about an hour and they don't see the shore and they come across a U.S. Navy destroyer, uh, ends up intercepting them and warns them that they were uh, heading to South America. <laughs> 180 degrees opposite where they're supposed to go. So this put uh, Lieutenant Olson woefully behind for the entire morning. Um, we'll go to the next slide here. And this is the example we're saying, Jeff, about about there's been planning, but they just there's not they've not they've not done the the full raft of all the things they could do and again as each successful amphibious or successive amphibious landing has there's more details out terrain maps more sand tables the photographic imagery and and by the time we get to things like the push into germany in 45 the information your average unit has is way better than what they'd had three years ago you know there's the aerial photos by the thousand you know so it's Again, 42 is really where everybody's still learning on the job and, and, and they're getting away with stuff that they would kind of cure uh, these problems true. later on. That's true. Now, later on, um, not to get off too far, but later on, um, before Operation Dragoon, uh, when they trained in Naples, uh, the, the, the same Navy crews and the same infantry and tanks trained together for that. That wasn't so much the case here. So they were training with different navy crews maybe than they had trained stateside and that sort of thing so that made a difference yeah so finally at uh um about 4 45 in the morning the first four assault waves finally head to shore uh they have some more navigational errors in the pitch darkness um particularly this uh, the second battalion of the seventh um they ended up further northeast at the wrong beaches uh, 30th Infantry Regiment also had elements landing on the wrong beaches. Um, at 520, searchlights come on on the beach and they sweep across these approaching boats as they're as they're coming ashore. Um, uh, they they say they were promptly shot out by by the armed support boats, but um, I do have an account where it took a little bit longer. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, most of these boats encountered a surf that was a little rougher than they expected. They also hit some unexpected rocks and sandbars. <clears throat> a number of them got hung up, some capsized and break apart. Uh, there are a few troops that drowned as a result. Uh, there's a lot of equipment that's lost. Um, I read that uh, 119 boats in these, these first few waves, uh, 57 of them were destroyed. So that's about half. Wow. Um, and these craft were supposed to make repeated runs, remember, ferrying troops and equipment for later. Uh, so this kind of screwed up the timetable even more. Uh, so if there was any hope of, of uh, making a quick uh, conquest of Casablanca, that was now off the table. Uh, next uh, slide here, we've got a, this is a map I, I lifted. This is from Rick At Atkins's website. It's excellent. Mm -hmm. um, this shows the intended landing sites. So those would be the short arrows you see near, near the beaches. Against the actual landing sites, those would be those long, curvy arrows all over the place. <laughs> okay, so starting on the left side, we've got the 1st Battalion. Uh, they're landing pretty close to where they're supposed to, 1st uh, Battalion of the 7th. Uh, the 2nd Battalion of the 7th, um, they ended up getting split up. Um, some companies landing as far as two miles northeast of the target beach. Uh, the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 30th were also split. Some were landing close to where they're supposed to, and others were landing much further east of where they're supposed to. <clears throat> to give you a sense of this confusion, I'll go to the next slide here. 
Um, I'd like to read uh, an excerpt if I can, if that's okay. Uh, uh, this is from uh, a correspondent, Hal Boyle. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He did some excellent work throughout the war. Um, he was riding with the third assault wave carrying 30th, 30th infantry troops. Uh, and this is what he wrote. He said, we were in the third assault wave. The first two waves, which, which preceded us by a matter of moments, landed safely on a four-mile stretch of beach between Cape Fadala and Pont du Blondin. They had reached shore in darkness, completely surprising French batteries at each end of the beach. As we neared the coastline, however, a bright searchlight stabbed the skies of Pont du Blondin and then swept seaward, catching our salt wave. In the bright glare that dazzled the coxswains, we ducked to the bottom of the boat. Machine gun bullets ripped across the water at us. A naval support boat on our left flank opened fire at the searchlight with 50 caliber machine guns. We could clearly see in quick glimpses the red path of trace bullets striking below and to the right of the shining target. Then came the grinding crash of our landing boat smashed full speed into a coral reef. The craft climbed futilely, then fell back into the water. From its ripped front ramp, the water climbed to our shoe tops and then surged to our knees. Every man overboard, said the boat commander. The next slide. Uh, we plunged from the sides of the settling craft up to our armpits in the surf and struggled to the reef. Waves washed over our heads, doubling the weight of our 60-pound packs but sweeping us near safety. I grabbed an outcropping of coral. A soldier there before me lay on it completely exhausted. He was unable to move and was blocking me. Twice the surf pulled me loose and twice it returned me. My strength was ebbing fast when another soldier pulled up the man before me and lent me a wet hand to safety. When I could stand again, I saw about scores of dripping soldiers their legs weary and wide braced. We had, we had to clamber across a 100-yard patch of spike-sharp coral reef and wade to shore. I found I had a two-inch gash on my right thumb and a lace work of cuts on both hands to remember our soggy trek through the coral. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, Boyle goes on to describe reaching uh, the pine grove and drawing fire. Uh, that'd be the next slide here kind of show you the wreckage on the beach. Our grove quickly became dangerous. We were caught between our own fire and the batteries of Pont du Blondin above us. One shell showered dirt only a few yards behind us as we splint away from the beach and turned toward Fadala. Wow. I thought that was kind of gripping. Yeah, and, and as we, you know, we're, the, the navigation errors, errors, tide errors, coral misjudgment, wrong place and under gunfire as well. I mean, it's, you know, it's someone said earlier, is it a hot landing? And I think the answer is def yes, it definitely is a hot landing. And some of the problems are, are actually of the, of the allies own making in a sense, you know, their own lack of, of, of navigation prowess, really. Correct. Right. Okay. The, uh, the four French, uh, uh, 138 millimeter guns at Fort Blondin, uh, near the Mount mouth of the Nafifik river, uh, they began firing on the east end of the landing zone. So they were turned landward. And so they were causing some of that turmoil. Um, and so at, at 615, uh, the very first official uh, third division soldier identified uh, directly to die in combat was a fellow named Private Earl F. Takala of Company F. Uh, he was cut down on uh, Beach Blue 2 by this these naval shell fragments. Okay, this is a photo. Next slide is a photo of Beach Blue 2 area. Uh, we're part of the 2nd Battalion, 30th uh, landed. Uh, you can see the, bri the bridge over the N Nafifik River there to the left. Uh, uh, further left and out of the picture uh, was Fort Blondin. Mm -hmm. um, this, is where, this was the uh, 30th's uh, primary objective. Now, mm -hmm. although the 30th and the 2nd Battalion, 7th Infantry had landed in scattered locations on either side of this emplacement, uh, the American c commanders on the ground were were pretty quick, and uh, and they turned this misfortune actually to their advantage, and they organized a multi-prong attack. 
Okay, this is a ground, as it was being organized, um, the destroyer Murphy uh, moved within five uh, uh, 5,000 yards of shore and fired upon the emplacements with its five-inch guns. Uh, return fire, uh, though, from that emplacement uh, struck the engine room. It killed three sailors, and that forced the Murphy to withdraw. Um, this ad hoc, ad hoc force comprising the uh, 30th and 7th uh, regiment troops uh, then bombarded the battery with the 81 millimeter mortar uh, and they also got some help delivered to them in the form of uh, six inch shells delivered from the cruiser Brooklyn from uh, 10,000 yards out. Okay next slide. Now uh, this is a, a the only photo I could find of actually of, of Pont Blonde and uh, that should be the installation right there this kind of the square. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this was well protected by barbed wire and machine guns and concrete emplacements. Uh, there was one officer there in charge. Uh, there were 77 uh, French coastal Marines also defending the facility. Um, uh, naval, uh, uh, naval fire led up slightly on the fort at uh, 7 o'clock, and uh, this three-prong attack from the ground commenced. Um, about, about a half hour of fight, and then the uh, white flag appeared at the fort, and the French surrendered at 7.30. Uh, in the attack, uh, they say officially there were four French killed and another four wounded. Uh, the 30th Infantry Regiment book claims there were six and 10 wounded, so who knows. Um, uh, five men uh, from the 30th that were later awarded uh, Silver Stars for organizing and carrying out this attack. Uh, this was a, an example, though, of, of, some, of some good uh, infantry preparation. Mm. Uh, these officers were well trained enough to pull this together uh, under these circumstances. Any questions so far? I was just going to make the comment, Jeff, about when Mike Nyberg comes on and he'll talk, isn't he? People in the sidebar saying, and we really did alert the French we're coming, you know, FDR did. Yes, because, and Mike Nyberg will make a really good case about why that had to be done because we're, we're not trying to wage war against the French. Yes, we understand that they, the Vichy are allied with the Axis, but we're not really at war with the French people. So we've got to give them a chart, the opportunity of surrendering. And, and as you, if we were talking about the other landings, there were garrisons that surrendered completely right at the beginning. There was no shots fired at all. So, so Mike's case about why they gave the warning will make perfect sense. And yet when you're presenting the case from the point of view of if you're on one of these destroyers or you're one of the infantrymen running up these beaches and someone said to them, oh, we, we gave them a warning. We, they told them, we told them we're coming. They'd have gone, what the fuck? You know, why did you do that? So from, yeah. from, the, from the political point of view, you can absolutely understand the reason for it. From the point of view of men landing on the beaches, they'd have been, as I say, like, what the hell are we doing that for? But... That's the difference of the uh, the understanding of history being very complex. It's uh, it's not it's not neat. It's not black and white. Yeah, it's also Im important to understand uh, that uh, that the, the, a huge advertisement. The, the Americans were given the uh, the front face to this whole thing. Of yeah. course, there was an enormous amount of British involvement, but the Americans were given the front face to this because of the long history. Yeah. Uh, a friendship between France and the United States. France and the United States had never been at war. Uh, uh, the French had helped the Americans, the French Navy especially, helped the Americans win their independence. And so there, there was a hope that they would play on that. So there were giant American flags flying. There were big, giant white stars on the tanks and flags plastered on the sides of the vehicles in hopes uh, that the French would see that and decide not to fight because... Mm -hmm. These were their friends, the Americans. So that's true. Yeah. Okay. So uh, while Fort uh, Blondin was captured, uh, the 1st Battalion of the 30th uh, pushed inland from Beach Blue uh, to capture the, uh, a train uh, at uh, also at 7 in the morning. Uh, they captured 75 uh, French troops off that train. Um, at this point, um, all of C Company 756 light tanks had made it ashore but uh, were either too late or uh, too scattered to contribute to any of the combat with the 30th. Um, and by noon, uh, with all the, the uh, uh, 30th Infantry Regiments ashore, uh, they, they ended up, well, hold on. Uh, by noon, all 30th of the 30th Infantry Regiments were ashore, but by uh, 1430, they had dug into the beach, headline, a beach line where they were supposed to be. And as a result, at that point, C Company uh, 
tanks were released uh, to the 7th Infantry Regiment because they were still fighting. So um, General Patton, well, we're going to the next one here. General Patton wanted to come ashore at about 8. As you can imagine, he was probably itching to get ashore. Uh, but he was delayed on account of a naval battle, and, I, and I'll let O'Hara describe that. But yep. uh, in short, um, um, while the attack on Fort Blondin was underway at about 7 that morning, um, a French cruiser and uh, seven destroyers and two subs came out of Casablanca Harbor to engage uh, the American naval forces. Um, and the French battleship Jean Bart, uh, that'd be the next slide, uh, also joined in fire. Uh, it was firing with those 15 inch shells on the USS Augusta and the Brooklyn from its dockside location in Casablanca. And uh, this battle went on for about four hours uh, before the French ships were finally driven off at about 1130. That's the next next slide, by the way. Yep. Right here. So we got some photos of it. Um, at uh, 1320, so just a little afternoon, Patton finally arrives on shore. And we'll go to the next slide here. And we'll touch up again with Ed Olson. Uh, we talked about him a little earlier. He has an interesting account. I thought it was kind of fun. Uh, remember, he he was the one in that errant uh, landing craft headed off to South America, remember? Uh, well, he finally arrives on shore later in the morning. It's a little too late uh, to, to get involved in the attacks on Fort Blondin, but uh, I thought he had a rather uh, interesting and humorous recollection of the events that morning. So here's an excerpt, again, if I if you don't mind me reading. Yeah, please it. do. We're loving it. Everyone's loving okay. it. Just keep going. Good. He writes, uh, things were quiet on the beachhead, and our landing was dry tack, in that we drove off the ramp of the landing craft onto dry sand. All our work and waterproofing proved to be unnecessary. There was a seawall in front of us. So we ran alongside it and proceeded to dewaterproof the tank under what little cover it gave us. Obviously, I had no idea where the other four tanks of my platoon were, and I had no luck raising them by radio. However, I did see a light tank up the beach with the crew digging around the front, indicating a track had been thrown. <clears throat> While the rest of my crew continued dewaterproofing, I ran up the beach to what I hoped might be one of my platoon. In it turned out to be an A Company tank with Lieutenant Donald F. Gorley and his crew down on hands and knees trying to clear the track. In relief at finally seeing familiar faces, I blurted out a greeting such as, well, Gurley, this is a hell of a place for you to throw a track. With that, a voice exploded in my ear. Who are you and what are you that you don't salute me when you come alongside me? Unfortunately, I had not paid uh, any attention to a man standing off to one side with his back turned toward me as I approached. To my horror, I turned and I looked into the blazing eyes of a face now inches from my own, the face of General George S. Patton. There he was in full array, unsaluted. He demanded to know what I was doing, what my mission was, and what I planned to do next. After what seemed like an hour's lecture on military courtesy, Followed by my explanation, he then became rather fatherly. Uh, he pointed up to the beach toward a tank, canted up on some rocks and said, now, Lieutenant, might that be one of your tanks? I assured him I would go find out. I gave him my best salute and I took off to check. It turned out not to be one of mine, but another A Company mishap with no crew in sight. I thought that uh, by my going up on the dunes for my return, I could avoid meeting my commanding general again. In doing so, I came to some small cottages overlooking the beach. So I stepped between two of them to survey the situation. First, I looked down on the beach. Then I glanced over to the porch of the cottage on my right. There, sitting on a chair with his feet up on the railing was, you guessed it, George Patton. <laughs> his query was was whether it was my tank. I said, no, sir. I saluted and I left. Uh, I saw him a few times later in the war, but never again under such circumstances. I, I, thought, I thought that was humorous. It's brilliant stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so we've covered now the left flank of the landings uh, to the capture, uh, the capture of Fort Blondin. So we're going to shift now to the 
right flank where the bulk of the 7th Infantry Regiment landed. Uh, remember, the objective of the 7th was to capture Vidala, take the Cape, destroy both those gun batteries. And then they were to go to the Mella River, that to the southwest, and, uh, and, and establish a line. Remember, it's important they achieve all these objectives so the port can be utilized the following day. <clears throat> any any questions yet? Um, no, we're good. I'm I'm I'm, I'm just I'm, yeah. I'm 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 spellbound. It's brilliant. I'm oh, good, loving good. it. Okay, uh, the Seventh Infantry Regiment was under the command of uh, Colonel Robert C. Macon. Um, where are we? Oh, you want yeah. me to move? Do you want me to move to the fort? Yeah, yeah go to the next one because we've yeah. got a nice picture of the peninsula there. Yeah. This, is, this was their objectives here. Uh, the 1st Battalion, the 7th, was under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Roy E. Moore. Uh, they reached Red Beach 2. That was roughly a mile east of Fadala at 5, uh, five o'clock uh, in the first landing waves. They were the ones that, that had the best of it. Um, their first two waves of landings were basically unopposed. Uh, but again, many of the boats got stuck on the reefs uh, separating Red Beach, uh, Beaches Red 2 and 3. Uh, again, leaving many of the men cut and battered and uh, loss of equipment. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Moore, he arrived in the third wave about a half hour later at 530. He ended up also on the rocks of Red Beach 2, and it took him nearly a half hour to reach his assault companies of A and C. Uh, both these companies were already attacking town. Um, his was the only, uh, Morse Battalion was the only one that landed in, in total darkness. All the others landed at dawn, which was at 545 or thereafter. Uh, and then at first light, those uh, coastal batteries and machine guns really started firing on the transports and arriving landing craft. And of course, the U.S. destroyers had to return fire. Now, Moore's men, uh, next slide, uh, they moved into town. Uh, they encountered some Senegalese troops who were pretty surprised to see them. Uh, they became disorganized kind of quickly and on seeing the Americans and offered no resistance, surrendered readily. Um, the first platoon from A Company uh, went on, uh, uh, surrounded, and then entered the Miramar Hotel. Uh, they were seeking to capture the, the German Armistice uh, Commission that was residing there. Uh, the commission happened to slip out of the hotel just ahead of them, but the platoon captured much of their paperwork. And then a short time later, the third platoon of C Company captured that same commission. Uh, there were about 10 German officials in this commission uh, just when they were attempting to flee in their car. So they ended up getting nabbed too. Um, now at this point, uh, because of the daylight and uh, people coming to life, uh, the naval gunfire is starting to fall near the hotel. Uh, this is causing a little bit of consternation with the more. He had set up his uh, CP in Miramar at seven that morning. Uh, he So he sends his uh, executive officer, Captain Everett Duval, to the beach to find somebody to stop that shelling. Um, at this point, uh, third division's assistant division commander, um, Brigadier General William M. Uh, William W. Eagles, uh, he was also ashore. Uh, he relayed the message, but the Navy didn't believe him. They wanted verification because uh, they were afraid of enemy deception. So he, his reply was, for God's sake, uh, stop shelling Fadala. You're killing your own men and friendly French groups. The shells are falling all over town. If you stop, they will surrender. Mm. Okay, in the meantime, that was true. Uh, more of these Senegalese troops uh, were uh, surrendering. Uh, they weren't putting up any resistance. It really wasn't any point. It would be suicidal. Uh, the shelling does stop for a spell, but then the 30th Infantry Regiment, remember at this same time, uh, they were trying to uh, capture that Fort Blondin, and they were getting uh, incoming fire from the Cape. Uh, those 75-millimeter guns were now turned inward on them, so they're now asking for the firing to start up again, at least on the Cape. Um, and now we're going to go to the next slide. We're going we're gonna to talk about this fella here. He's rather important. Um, when the 1st Battalion of the 7th first landed prior to dawn, uh, one of these boats contained this fellow. His name was Colonel William H. Wilbur. He was dispatched by General Patton uh, with armistice terms to deliver to the French. So this is uh, that political part of this yep. that we were talking about. Uh, Wilbur's boat reached shore at uh, 530. 
Uh, he had an amphibious Jeep on and uh, he had a radio. He was flying a big giant American flag and a nice big white flag of truce. Uh, his Jeep failed to start. Uh, so he had to wait for the next one to land and commandeer it and then transfer all that stuff over to that. Uh, then he sets out with his chauffeur driving. Uh, they have a French uh, captain following in a civilian car. Uh, they drive to Casablanca. Um, uh, they're, they're not fired upon during that drive. Um, they arrive at the French division headquarters down there and they find French General Des Desray and uh, Admiral Renarc. Uh, but neither man would receive the letter. They wouldn't accept it. They said... Admiral Michelet was in charge. Uh, so they leave the letter on Desiree's desk. Uh, Wilbur then drives next. Uh, he goes with that French captain over uh, to the French Admiralty, uh, searching for Michelet. Uh, and by this time, uh, uh, French aerial bombs and Navy shells uh, start falling around the place. Uh, and this kind of angers the French there. <laughs> and so the French Navy captain in charge refuses to admit Wilbur. Uh, and says, uh, just get out. So uh, Wilbur has to drive back to Fadala. Uh, this time he's encountering French sailors along the way who were a bit surly and quite threatening. Uh, he does arrive to at, back at Fadala. And so he checks in at the command post for the 1st Battalion there at Miramar Hotel. He catch up on progress. He then heads over to the 3rd Division headquarters that just been established. Uh, to send a voice message to Patton, uh, telling him what happened. Uh, and he tells uh, Patton uh, that he, the French army seems reluctant to fight, but the French Navy is quite agitated. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, returning, he goes to the beach. He goes back. He's trying to find a way to get back to Patton aboard the Augusta. Uh, but while he's there, he sees uh, the arriving boats being fired upon by that naval battle or that 75 millimeter a gun battery on the Cape. And so he decides to organize an attack against it. And it just so happens, you know, next slide here, as he's, as he's doing that, uh, it, uh, this is about uh, 8.30 in the morning, uh, the wave of boats carrying Lieutenant Rutledge's second platoon start arriving. Um, all five of his tanks make it ashore safely. Uh, one of them uh, gets separated and ends up driving off in the wrong direction for some reason. So he's left with four. Uh, Colonel Wilbur uh, approaches Rutledge and uh, as they're dewaterproofing their tank. And uh, they're again, they're under fire by the, the seven, 75 millimeter guns on the Cape. Um, now Rutledge is, was uh, assigned to uh, support the 2nd Battalion, the 7th, and... Uh, the, it was the 1st Battalion that was attacking the Cape. Uh, the 1st Battali Platoon tanks hadn't arrived yet uh, to support the 1st Battalion. Uh, so the, both of these officers confer about the situation. And uh, uh, Rutledge agrees to Wilbur commandeering uh, his platoon to carry out the mission. So Wilbur climbs on top of uh, Rutledge's tank and they head uh, to town. Uh, and into Fadala, they meet with Colonel Macon. Uh, at the Miramar, and uh, this is about at uh, nine in the morning. Uh, Macon agrees to Wilbur taking the tanks uh, forward to support the 1st Battalion as they're attacking on the Cape, but he reminds him that Lieutenant Colonel Moore is still in charge and that Wilbur, though he's outranks, outranks Wilbur, uh, Moore, uh, has to go according to uh, Moore's plans, which Wilbur, of course, agrees to. Um, and so Wilbur sets off on uh, Rutledge's tank uh, to the Cape, uh, off they go. And uh, they meet up with Lieutenant Colonel Moore. That'd be the next slide. And they halt just outside of town. Um, Moore uh, reconnoiters ahead and then formulates an attack plan. Um, in order to get to those 75 millimeter guns you see on the map, we've got those four 100 millimeters there right at the base of the peninsula. He's got to get those first. And he sees uh, there's a critical fire control building uh, to the battery on a small hill near nearby. It's surrounded by barbed wire, and he tar decides to target that one. Uh, a company opens fire on the building with all their weapons. Uh, at 1030, B company is uh, placed in a support position to allow an attack. Um, the engineers cut through some of the surrounding barbed wire 
And then one of Rutledge's tanks is sent forward uh, to, to move through the opening, but it hits something and then uh, it hits an embankment, I believe, and then it overturned. Uh, the French were at this point were returning fire, but uh, Moore's assault troops were too numerous. They break through, they overrun the station. And at the same time, C Company overwhelms the gun positions themselves. Those were the 100 millimeter gun positions. Um, they take 22 prisoners uh, uh, captive. Uh, they find five uh, French dead, unfortunately. Um, the three remaining tanks from Rutledge's platoon um, also arrive at the fire control station. Wilbur's still riding along on Rutledge's tank. Uh, the French commander insisted on lowering the French flag himself. Uh, he was allowed to do so. Uh, at uh, 1201. Uh, and uh, once the French flag comes down, the U.S. flag was raised and both American and French officers salute it as it's being raised. Kind of kind of odd, but as you again, that the politics, right? Mm. Um, Wilbur uh, was next slide. Uh, uh, Wilbur was awarded the Medal of Honor later for all his actions this morning, uh, carrying out that dangerous mission to Casablanca and also recognizing the need to, to get some tanks into that attack on the Cape to silence the French guns. And um, I think, just to let you have, have a break for your voice for a minute or two, I think Wilbur's Medal of Honor sums up really exactly op what Operation Torch is. It, in the, it's a diplomatic political mission and combat happening at the same time. You're there he is literally there for both reasons. He's there to kind of do a deal deal like, like, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, in the Kelly's heroes, but also get on board a tank and go in there and, and kick ass when you have to do it. It, it. To me, that symbolizes exactly the yeah. weirdness of torch. It's both a, it's both a, a political um, kind of posturing and, and trying to breach this, broach this deal with the frame, but also it's combat. So to me, it's, it's symbolic of it, a whole thing. It's also a lot of improvisation, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, with the uh, the captured fire control station um, and and the uh, capture of those that gun battery, they still had to uh, get those uh, 75 millimeter guns. They're still a threat. Um, uh, they uh, organized an attack uh, set for 1330. Uh, so about 130 that afternoon. Uh, this was to be uh, uh, there would be a, a five minute mortar concentration on the position before they attacked. Uh, the three tanks from Rutledge's platoon would be involved. Uh, but just before they were ready to jump off, uh, there was a French civilian that approached them from the Cape and uh, said that the French there uh, wished to surrender and they wanted to see an officer uh, to discuss the terms. So an American captain went forward with the civilian uh, they found that French officer. Uh, he was uh, there with about 50 or 60 men. Uh, they already had their weapons and ammunition all lined up, stacked on the grounds. Uh, uh, the captain uh, asked for 10 men to come forward to help process them and guard them. Uh, they searched the grounds. They found about 20 more prisoners. Uh, but uh, by uh, 1,500 hours, uh, the Cape was considered cleared. All French batteries were silenced. And uh, with that, uh, the 1st Battalion of the 7th Infantry had accomplished all its main tasks. Uh, it took Fadala and it silenced both those Peninsula gun batteries. We had a question about that photo from Ian Carr, Jeff. He's saying, are those fuel tanks in the World War II photo? Is that, or is that a post-war photo? Or, and indeed, are they fuel tanks? Yes, in that yes photo? those are fuel tanks. Uh, Fadala also had a large petroleum facility on there. Uh, it was... Uh, they didn't want to set fire to those things, right? I think I think one was hit by accident, and caught fire. Maybe, maybe uh, uh, Vincent O'Hara might know more about that. But uh, they wanted to preserve those, of course. Mm -hmm. So you, okay. you also have that added. Uh, uh, you don't want a whole lot of collateral damage too in this operation. So no, definitely brilliant stuff. Back to you. Okay. Well, um, we'll talk a little bit about the second battalion of Seventh Infantry. Uh, they were the one that got scattered. Uh, just, just real briefly, they were under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Raphael Salzman. Uh, they had a much rougher go that morning. Uh, they were spread all over the place. Uh, uh, this were the this was the battalion Rutledge's tanks were supposed to support. Um, they were strewn over several beaches. It took a great deal of time for them to organize. Um, 
I'll go to the next slide. You can see here on this next slide here, company E and F, they're circled in yellow on that map. Uh, they ended up on a beach way east uh, near this Montsoria rail station. This was seven miles away from where they were supposed to land. Uh, uh, they, they had to also contend with some rough, rocky beaches and stuff, but uh, and, and they had some boat damage and equipment loss, but fortunately they didn't have any opposition at all. Um, and then they had to backtrack and work their way the rest of the morning and early afternoon uh, back to Fadala. Um, they followed that rail line. Uh, they, they were subjected to a couple of strafings from some French planes, but they didn't receive any kind of a small arms fire. And finally, at about uh, 2.30, uh, they find Colonel Salzman. And uh, they finally reach their initial objectives, their morning objectives. They secure the road and the rail crossings over that Wadi Mela. That's way down at the lower left of that map. You can see how far off track they were. They were they, they had it about the worst. Okay, we'll go to the next slide and we'll give the, the viewers a sense. This is a modern photo. I just took this off Google Earth. Yeah. But you can you can really get a good look at these beaches. This is the beaches of Fadala. Of course, it's all built up now. Uh, those would be way on the left, all the way over to Pont, Point Blondin on the right. And uh, you can see how treacherous it is, treacherous it is in some areas. Um, it's Sandy Beach closer to Fadala, but you've got some um, areas where you've got that coral right there in the middle and, and about a quarter way over on the right. And this was that sharp, rocky coral the men spoke mm. of or the photos you see. Okay, on to the next one. <clears throat> okay, with the... With the capture of the gun batteries, the, the rest of uh, the forces could come ashore. Uh, the 15th Infantry Regiment, that were the reserve regiment, they came ashore that afternoon. Um, but the loss of the landing craft uh, retarded the arrival of these waves. Uh, this is about 12 hours you know, after H hour. And, and at this point, only about 40% of the men are ashore. Only 16% of the vehicles and only 1% of the supplies they need are ashore. Um, their, their objective that day was to secure a beachhead, uh, 11 miles wide and five miles deep, but by nightfall, they're still about three miles short of that objective. Next. Uh, so, uh, on the plus though, they have the town, they have the beach, the Harbor, all this is secure. Uh, this allows the transports and cargo ships to move in a little closer to the shore and pick up the pace of moving men and supplies in. Um, next. Now we're going to move on to the next morning. This is the 9th of November. We'll move a little quicker here. Uh, General uh, Anderson organized a four battalion wide drive toward Casablanca. Uh, nobody knows again at the time if the French are going to capitulate or they're going to put up a bloody fight and this is going to be a, a street battle. Um, so Anderson's immediate aim though is to get his troops into assembly areas just west of town and to stage for that attack. Uh, progress at first during the day is good. It's only against some small arms fire and some occasional French uh, aerial strafing. Next slide. <clears throat> but that uh, slow arrival, arrival of vehicles, uh, however, uh, hinders a Anderson's progress. Um, most of the tanks are still aboard the transports. Those would be the, uh, the, the 67th Armored Regiment. Uh, they only had a few trucks ashore to help... Uh, cover that growing supply line, uh, that distance between these men and Fadala. Um, because of this logistical problem, uh, Anderson had to halt his uh, four battalions six miles short of Casablanca and wait. Um, and because of this, Patton requested a heavier emphasis on supplies uh, being taken ashore uh, by uh, 1430 hours, uh, 12, uh, you know, about 230 uh, the tanks of the 67th Armored Regiment finally began arriving at the beach. Um, by 1700, uh, about 55% of the troops were ashore, 31% of the vehicles, but still only 3% of the supplies that were needed were ashore. So this is day two. Mm. Okay, this is good. Now we've got another picture. This is, this is a, a 756 tank right here. This is an A Company tank, I believe. Um, so um, by midnight on the 9th, uh, so it would be the 9th to the 10th of November, uh, Anderson's troops resume the advance on Casablanca. Again, the 7th 
is advancing on the right. That's along the coast. The 15th is advancing on the left. That's inland. Uh, A and C companies, uh, tanks from, from both uh, companies of the 756 are accompanying this drive. Uh, the 7th Regiment, um, they advance another two miles without difficulty, but then they run into some heavy artillery, uh, French artillery, near the village of Ain Saba, and they're forced to halt. Uh, the 15th is moving there on the left. Uh, they also halt. Uh, they they get some reconnaissance reports uh, showing a French troop presence near a, a town of, of Tite Malil. They don't know the size of it, so they also halt. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide here. Now we're on uh, date uh, the second day or third day. Uh, this is November 10th. Uh, they still don't have an answer to uh, Colonel Wilbur's ceasefire proposal. Uh, so Patton has to dispatch his own chief of staff. This was Colonel Holbert, Holbert R. Gay uh, with another overture. Um, in the meantime, a, a third division, uh, they staged, they prepared to attack Casablanca. And this is where we get into that politics, right? There's all this complex yeah, yeah. negotiating taking place behind the scenes that's involving everybody, all the way up to Marshal Patton in, in Vichy, France. Uh, now, you know, under the 1940s, 1940 armistice, the French were required to defend their colonies from the Allies, right? So they can't be seen by the Germans as capitulating too quickly. Uh, so uh, you got to put yourself in the situation. You're a French officer at this time, and it's basically a treason trap either way for you, you know? Uh, so Putin, or um, Putin, <laughs> Patain, Patain uh, refuses uh, to authorize a surrender, but he delegates the decision to Admiral Jean Darlin. Yeah. Uh, uh, he then uh, kicks it down. Uh, he allows the invasion to continue uh, until the situation is hopeless, and he allows his subordinate commanders uh, to decide uh, when they should lay down arms. So we are. It's a local problem basically mm -hmm. at this point. So next slide, uh, mid-morning, uh, November yeah, 10th, uh, the 7th is, is still pushing on Casablanca. They're encountering more resistance. They, over, they overrun several uh, more um, machine gun positions that French have. Uh, now, at this point, a little something a little strange happens. Uh, some French warships uh, find a gap <clears throat> in the American naval defenses, and they fire upon the encroaching 7th Infantry Regiment troops moving along the coast. Uh, these, these ships have to be engaged and driven back to port. Uh, the Augusta and the four, and four destroyers are involved in that action. Uh, at the same time, the 15th Infantry Regiment, they resume uh, their advance. They envelop uh, Tiet Malil. Uh, now they're flanking Casablanca. Uh, actually, it turns out this day was the bloodiest in Operation Brushwood. Um, 36 Americans were killed and another uh, 113 were wounded. Wow. And just to add a bit of the complication of this, Jeff, is that the men in this battalion, to, to be dealing with an enemy that you're not even able to completely classify them as an enemy, it's because there's right. still this these, these, these deals trying to be struck. I mean... At least if you're landing in, in, in Anzio or Normandy or, or your Operation Varsity, you know that the people there are the enemy. The Germans are defending and they're going to try and kill you and your job is trying to kill them. In this yes. case, with it being French troops, it's, this must be difficult getting in that tank in the morning and going, well, are we meant to shoot back or not? You know, it's kind of that modern rules of engagement type concept yes, yes, that we yes. think of of modern yes. wars. It's It must have added a huge layer of stress to these guys in that they're they don't really want to fight the French, but at the same point, if the French are shooting at them, you've, you've got to shoot back. It's a level of complication that I think we, we overlook, except with torch. Yeah, well, actually, my 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 empathy is with the French. Uh, do you really want to fight your liberators? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you have some some units that you don't want to fight. Or it's yeah, it's a mess. It, it's a political it's a political mess. So it was very dicey. Um. So, and, and so now you've got uh, you've got this uh, this force uh, this nineteen thousand man force closing in on on town, and you don't know what's going to happen. Um, so they're, they're they've closed into the east and south of Casablanca. Um, we'll go to the next slide here. 
All right, so this is to give you a sense of the whole movement here from start to finish to give, mm -hmm. give the viewer a good sense of that. It's a perfect map for it. Now, fortunately, um, at, uh, on, on the 10th, uh, at 1910, uh, a ceasefire finally came, was issued in Casablanca. Uh, so the politics behind the scenes finally, finally bore fruit. Uh, now, there was still sniping that continued well after that. Uh, this continues because uh, word of the ceasefire hadn't traveled out to everybody. Um, but, at, but basically, after three days, Operation Brushwood essentially ends this way. It ends, well, in a whimper, right? And, and thankfully so, because uh, uh, of everyone that was involved, especially the civilians of Casablanca, it would have been pretty, pretty nasty to be fighting in the, in the streets of that town. And we'll go on to the next frame, happier stuff here, I think. Uh, we'll talk about some of the lessons learned here. Um, and, of course, the big one was uh, all those landing craft that were lost. Uh, you know, again, uh, there was 100, uh, 347 landing craft. I, I, I got a statistic involved. And of those, 160 were, were wrecked or lost. So that's about half of them. That's pretty bad, <laughs> you know. Uh, so a big lesson is they have to continue, uh, allies have to continue practicing their amphibious landings. Um, and a few months later, uh, the 5th Army Invasion Training Center was established at Iran uh, to help improve upon the, uh, that, that whole, the whole operation, those tactics. Uh, they have to engage in better ship shore transfers. Uh, it's too vulnerable the way they were doing it this time. Uh, this is where these new ships come in, these LCTs and LSTs. Uh, they can carry more tanks. They can deliver them closer to shore. Um, the shuttling back and forth uh, uh, between the beach is also dangerous. Uh, you you want to be careful doing that. You've got ships going in two directions or boats going in two directions. Uh, the other lesson in this was that night landings are extremely difficult. Uh, anytime you're going to do these, there's got to be a cost-benefit analysis to these missions. Um, uh, this photo here, uh, I, I love this. I think it's a beautiful photo. Uh, I think this is the 1st Battalion 67th uh, Armored Regiment tank on patrol in Casablanca. But it, get, it shows you the, how, it was a modern town, right? Yeah, that, that, that came up in the sidebar about how modern Casablanca looks. But like lots of ports around the world, like Singapore, like places in Malta, it, because it's a port town, it's often the first to develop new things because they, they get everything new. It's like the rock and roll music arrived in Liverpool first because it was the port. It was the boats going from the USA. So Casablanca was very, uh, you know, it was taking a lot of culture from France and from, from the Mediterranean, Italy. So, yeah, surprisingly modern looking there. Yes. Okay, the next photo. This this is a nice photo of a couple we were talking earlier about the big giant flag plastered on the slide yeah. with the white big giant white star in the front and the side, all trying to raise the profile. This was an American landing, you know, to, so the French hopefully wouldn't fire on them. Uh, again, I think this is the first battalion, 67th Armored Regiment tank position in Casablanca. This is after the ceasefire. Okay, next we'll, we're going to look at the Jean Bart here. Um, Again, the toughest resistance was from the French Navy. Uh, this is the Jean Bart. Uh, it's sitting partially sunk there in, at the pier at Casablanca. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide here. Um, I don't want to steal thunder from 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 um, O'Hara. Uh, it was uh, it was in port for repairs. Again, its 15-inch guns were 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 a, a real threat. So uh, American planes bombed it and knocked it out of commission. Um, so you can see the damage that it sustained. Yeah. No, they're here's, great photos. I said Vince, Vince will take us through this in yeah. more detail tomorrow. Yeah, here's so. another one. Yeah, we'll just zip through that one too. On to the onto the next one. Uh, this did leave quite an impression on uh the B company and uh headquarters companies uh tankers that arrived a month later. They they went right by the ship as they came to the port into port. Uh and okay, so we'll let's go on to this next slide after that, right to the third division. Um this is a chart. Uh, this is the third division reinforced with the, with the um, 67th armored. Um, this is an after action from their after action reports. This is showing their casualty counts uh, for their four days uh, broken down by unit. Um, now the seventh infantry bore the brunt of the cost. Uh, they had 46 men killed, 146 wounded and 17 missing in action. I'd imagine a number of those guys probably drowned. Um, the heaviest losses were on the 10th. 
when they were closing in on Casablanca. Uh, overall, the uh, division listed losses at the time of 85 killed, uh, 347 wounded, and 42 missing. Um, it's important, you know, it's important that people don't think that this was kind of a cakewalk uh, or a low casualty operation. Uh, you can see from these figures, they're pretty substantial. Um, and the French did put up some spirit of resistance in places, especially on the outskirts of Casablanca. Um, I thought it might be fun. And next slide, I'm just going to show some of the stuff that I go through all the time. Uh, these are the morning reports from A Company as 756. Um, you can see a, a roster of the six officers that were involved. Uh, there are also roles showing 104 uh, enlisted men were in, in the company at the time. We'll move on to the next one. Uh, this is also from the morning reports, um, A Company, a record of events. Uh, you can see here on the 10th a report, uh, this is the unfortunate drowning of Private First Class Anthony M. Learle. Uh, Learle uh, drowned when one of these lighter boats overturned in the surf. Uh, he was the 756 uh, Tank Battalion's only death during Operation Brushwood, fortunately for, for the battalion, but unfortunately for him. Um, next one. A Company also reports uh, a private Goldsbury as wounded in action on the 11th. Uh, I'll show some more details about him in a second here. And next, we'll, next slide here. Just to jump in quickly, Jeff, it's interesting because, you know, one fatality there, by, by the metric of losses, the 756 don't have an awful torch landing. But by the metric of things that can go wrong in terms of the, the beaches and navigation and things, there's a lot that can be improved on. So, so it, for historians looking at this post-event, you could kind of say, well, not many men killed. It must have been a roaring success. But but casualties are only only part of the story. That the learning right. curve is much more right. uh, complicated than just the death toll. Right. And uh, this wasn't a, a tank led attack. Okay, this was an infantry led attack. The tanks were sort of following. Right. So there wasn't. Yeah. There, there, you wouldn't expect a high casualty count at this point. But the infantry, uh, they suffered some pretty high losses in my view. Um, yeah. Uh, this one here, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, again, a morning report, the 29th of November. Here's where Lyrell's status has changed from missing uh, to deceased. Uh, he was buried at Casablanca temporarily and then later moved to U.S. Military Cemetery, Tunisia. And we'll move on to the next one here. Um, here's his draft. Here's his draft card um, information. Uh, this is the kind of stuff I go through. I find this stuff interesting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, he he's he was a battalion's uh, very first death in the line of duty. Uh, during the war, the battalion would have 130 men killed. Uh, so he would be, uh, had the dubious distinction to be in the very first. The next slide, and we're going to go back to the that Vincent Goldsbury. Um, he was the only man I could find that was wounded in the battalion. I don't know exactly what his duties were in A Company, but I strongly suspect he was a mechanic, judging from uh, a mention uh, in the article here of, of mechanic school. Um, he lost one of his eyes. Uh, he was hit by shrapnel. Uh, eventually, he received an honorable discharge a few months later, and it appears he was uh, promoted corporal before his separation from service. So he was a casualty. Uh, he wasn't killed, but he wasn't able to fight anymore. Okay. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit on uh, on on, you know, maybe O'Hare might get into this, but, so, but, uh, but I wanted to follow up. The USS Curb was a transport that carried A Company. I couldn't find anything on it. Um, I, I did learn a, a lot about the Hugh Scott, though. The Hugh Scott carried C Company. It was sunk uh, November 12th, <laughs> right off the coast of Fadala. Um, on the evening of the 11th of November, a German U-boat, the U-173, uh, slipped through uh, destroyer protection and torpedoed uh, several ships. Uh, the Hugh Scott wasn't one at that time, but uh, they remained on battle stations all night and then resumed loading the next day. And then that afternoon, uh, November 12th, another U-boat, the U-130, torpedoed the Scott, uh, the Rutledge, and the Tasker H. Bliss. Uh, the Scott was hit in the starboard side. It burst into flames. It 
foundered, uh, but by using landing craft to, to rescue, um, casualties were limited to eight officers and 51 men. Uh, the U-73, U-173 was later sunk, but the U-130 escaped. I, I, O'Hara probably has some stuff on that. He probably does. Yeah. I'll ask him and I'll, I'll ask him to get in contact with you. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I'd love to, I'd love to, I'm looking forward to his presentation. Um, next slide. Okay. With the armistice now firmly in place, American and French forces resume their roles as traditional allies. Uh, they, you know, the buried, the dead, uh, the French, it's funny. They even apologized for putting up resistance in this point of this newspaper. Uh, the bottom right photo there that shows Major General Anderson, the third division. He's showing French General Nogues how to operate an M1 Garin. Uh, I think that's a great photo because the U.S. would end up equipping and training free French forces thereafter. Uh, these units would later go on and play uh, crucial roles uh, in Italy and France. Also, as a side note, as personal, my grandfather spoke fluent French. And he uh, was involved in the Fifth Army and Raising Training Center for 14 months before he was with the 756. And he, so he helped train French forces how to use American equipment. That's just a side note. All right, next slide. Um, uh, Mid-January 1943, uh, Franklin Roosevelt flew to Casablanca to meet with British Prime Minister Churchill and uh, with three French and Soviet representatives to do a, more war planning. And uh, Lieutenant Rutledge, uh, his platoon was called to serve as honor guard for the president. Uh, there's a little uh, report of that up in that newspaper clipping at the top. The photo there at the bottom right, that's those are 70th tank battalion light tanks rolling by uh, for review in that conference. And next one. Um, how are we doing on time, by the way? Oh, we're fine. I keep going. Don't worry. Great, we great, just had great. a question. How did your grandfather know how to speak French? How had he learned it at school or family? Well, or? Because he was actually born in Montreal, Canada. There we are. And so he was bilingual. He came over as a teenager to the United States with his family and was naturalized citizen. So uh, he spoke French because he was uh, French. He was Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Um, again, because of ally concerns that uh, Spain might flip over to the Axis cause, uh, Third Division, the 756, were uh, moved further north to Rabat, closer to the Spanish-Moroccan border. And so for the next several months, uh, they remained there watching the border. And uh, as more uh, ships and convoys and equipment arrived uh, from the States. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, they established a camp in the uh, Cork, Oak, Cork Oak Forests at Memora in December 1943. The, the camp was named after uh, uh, the uh, third division soldier who was killed, uh, first killed on the beach there. Camp Takala was the name. Uh, now that photo there on the far right, that is an A Company 756 tank battalion member. Uh, he's in his combat coveralls and helmet and goggles. Uh, I like that photo. I thought you'd like that one. Mm. Next, we got another photo. Same, same thing. A Company tanks. You know, go to the next slide. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. Yep. A Company tanks. Uh, this is at the Cork Forest. There, uh, they're dispersed underneath these things. Uh, that, that's to evade aerial observation. <clears throat> now it was hot and dusty, but it wasn't too terribly unpleasant for these guys. Uh, they actually kind of. <laughs> Well, they kind of collected all kinds of odds and ends and, and junk and bicycles and things while they were there. I did the next frame. There's another in the photo of them. You can kind of see that it's kind of like camping, right? Um, a B Company and H and headquarters company, uh, they arrived on a separate convoy in January 43. They joined the battalion here. Uh, so they're reunited with them again the first time since October 1942. And afterwards, they uh, resumed training with the 3rd Infantry Division. Uh, next slide. And they also uh, did some special uh, desert exercises with the French. Um, and this experience with the French will prove valuable later for the 756 because uh, they'll be attached directly to French forces uh, for 10 days during the Italian campaign. Wow. Yeah, next slide. Yep. Uh, we'll move quickly here. We're, 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 we're wrapping it up. 
So uh, in April 1943, the 3rd Division, the 756, they, they either uh, loaded up on rail cars or they formed motor convoys, and they headed east to Iran. <clears throat> this is where the 5th Army Invasion Training Center was set up. Uh, they got some additional amphibious training there. Next slide. And at the same time, in early April, uh, B Company Commander uh, Captain Charles Wilkinson uh, the battalion uh, supply officer, uh, Captain Oscar Long, and uh, several platoon sergeants were sent to Tunisia as combat observers. Um, <clears throat> they were attached to the 751st Tank Battalion. Uh, these were medium tanks. These were those M3 Lees or Grants, depending on where you're from. Uh, the, the, those you, you're familiar with those, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, they were fighting with the uh, U.S. 34th Infantry Division and the British 6th Armored Division at Fonduk Pass. That's about in the middle of that map right there. Um, next slide. Uh, the Germans were holding this pass, uh, but uh, at this time, the, the famed Africa Corps was being compressed. Uh, up into Tunisia from Allied pressure from both the east and the west, and uh, they only have a, a few, a couple more weeks left of life. Uh, here's just a, a kind of a quick map here. Next slide. Uh, they did. They fought hard. They, they hold the pass, and it did take an enormous amount of British armor to finally break through. Uh, now these observers from the 756. Uh, one thing they noticed during this whole uh, action was that there were no light tanks involved, uh, only mediums. Uh, and this made them realize that their M5 lights were already obsolete. Yeah, yeah. The next slide here. Um, and as a result of that, uh, they were left out of the order of battle for the invasion of Sicily. The 3rd Division went on ahead of them. And they, uh, they were then wait, that waiting at uh, Bizerte Harbor in Tunisia for their next assignment. Uh, this here is a photo. I love this photo. This is a B Company members. Uh, they're gathered around a captured German Mark IV tank uh, left in the desert after the destruction of the Africa Corps. <clears throat> and we've got just one kind of summation here. Next slide. Uh, the 756 was eventually called forward to shore up the Salerno landings in Italy in September 43. And then in December of 43, they were finally upgraded to a medium tank battalion and equipped with M4 Shermans. And from there, uh, they were immediately thrown into the Battle of Casino uh, and uh, saw nearly nonstop combat action up until the end of the war, 16 months later. And with that, uh, that concludes the talk. Well, I can I, I can promise you, Jeff, and I can hear you're losing your voice, so you won't do many questions. People I are going to absolutely invite you to come back and do the Italian campaign because because you know this has been this has been a stunning presentation. And and there, folks, there 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 are Jeff's books. There, I say the link to Jeff's website is in the description below. There are links to purchasing a couple of the books down there. But you know, I, you, you you know yourself now, folks. You've got to go out there and support our authors with actually buying their books because I, I say every now, don't say it enough actually, when my guests come on the channel, they're doing their time free, they're coming here to tell you these stuff. So the least you can do now is, is get your get your credit cards out, get your bank bit and go and buy some books and have them because yeah. no one makes any money as a military historian, especially if you're a, 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 someone like Jeff who's studying one unit. People at the very top end, your James Hollands, Peter Caddick, Adams, John McManus, they're able to make a living at a, at a military author but most people who come on it's a it's a hobby at the best and so the least you can do is go out there and um and buy a couple of books and and will you be will you be happy to come back and do italy with us oh i would love to yeah or or an aspect of it is it that's a broad yeah subject. we can break it down to some several <laughs> shows there and you know and again i said it in the, in the introduction you know you're 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 members of these various associations you're involved with people you know obviously the veterans back in the day and their family members so um, you, you know, you're chronicling individuals who served as well as as well as the the, the battles themselves. It's really important. Thank you. I, it's been an honor. Thank you. So Thank much. you. And so my yeah, my last my summary of this, and we won't do a question because it's been it's been a long time, folks. We'll bring it back, Jeff, in the future. Is that it's taught me your presentation has taught me that looking at American armor in Tunisia, 
you can't do it with a sweeping brush. You can't just use generalizations of they weren't very well trained or have you've got to break it down. You, there's the devil is in the detail. Yeah. And that there are some units who've got tanks they've only been given recently. But you know, what you've taken us through is just a unit that actually had been very, very well trained, had been a lot of time. They're spending time working with the French, they're working with the infantry, and it's it's it's, I think people agree watching it's not what they think of as American armor in North Africa. There's a sense, okay, there's been lots of problems along the way and, and navigation er er errors and what have you, but it's a unit that actually tries to establish a way of fighting war. And I think that's important. Yeah, I think it's well well summarized. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, well, we'll, we'll bring things to an end. So, folks, Vincent O'Hara's in the same time tomorrow. We'll do the naval battle. So it'll, we've done Casablanca to some detail now. Meredith took us through the spies. Jeff has taken us through a massive, a brilliant uh, uh, um, summary of Brushwood. And then tomorrow we'll be talking about what happened at sea. And then we can always revisit these subjects later on. So, Jeff, uh, I, you deserve a, a beer or a whiskey of your choice, wherever it is. It's 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 time. I know it's uh, it's early in the day there. I'm going to have a bit of whiskey. Yeah, it's been fantastic. So, folks, you know what to do. Go out there and get those books ordered. And the same for all of my guests. So, um, Jeff, thank you very much again. Folks, thank you very thank much you. for watching. I will see you all again tomorrow. This is Paul Woodhead for World War II TV saying enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.